World War II was a global conflict unlike any the world had ever seen. Whole cities were destroyed, countries were overtaken, and death was seen on a scale that no one could imagine. All of this culminated in the first truly existential threat to humanity. This story is about more than just one man's plan to take over the world. It's about the triumph of good over evil, of individuals who risked their lives for the freedom of future generations. These heroes were aided by scientific advancements that are still making a difference today. From Alexander Fleming's invention of penicillin to the invention of frozen blood products. But lost in the history of World War II is a medication that was initially meant to treat pain that has been used to fight addiction and prevent the spread of disease. This is the history of methadone. Now the story of methadone starts in Germany. This is where Adolf Hitler had the vision that the German race would take over all of Europe. And in order to do this, this was going to require war. And war meant casualties. And casualties require medications, particularly the pain medication of morphine. And for morphine, you need opium. Opium comes from the Middle East and Asia. Unfortunately for Germany, the Allied forces were able to block the Nazis from getting this much needed opium. And this is where a company called IG Farben comes in. At the time, they were the largest company in all of Europe. And their name literally stood for IG Dye Stuffs. And that's because they made things like chemicals, materials, and pharmaceuticals. IG Farben was the parent company to Bayer. And they also worked hand in hand with the Nazis. This company infamously created Zyklon B, which was the gas version of cyanide that was used in the concentration camps. They also had a factory named Hoest, which was working on solving this opioid problem the Nazis had, and they were trying to make a synthetic version. And it was here that they came up with methadone, but they decided not to use it because initial studies showed that the side effects were intolerable. Instead, they used a drug called pethidine, which is also known by the brand name Demerol. And then, of course, we all know how the next steps go. The Americans and the British come from one side, the Soviets from the other, Germany's defeated, and it ends in unconditional surrender. And because of this unconditional surrender, after the war was over, all of the German studies, research, and patents were made available to the Allied forces. The United States Department of Commerce and the U.S. State Department worked together to confiscate the records from Hoest, which included methadone, and brought these back to the United States. In 1947, Eli Lilly started producing methadone under the brand name Dolophine, which was Latin for pain end. Fast forward to the 1950s and the 1960s, and heroin use was skyrocketing in the United States. The American Medical Association and the American Bar Association started calling for specific narcotic clinics to be established to treat this drug abuse. And it was particularly bad in New York City, where the New York Health Research Council put together a team in 1963 led by Dr. Vincent Dole with the goal of treating heroin addiction. This team also included famous addiction specialists like Dr. Marie Nyswander and Dr. Mary Creek. In 1964, this team got their own inpatient unit in New York's Rockefeller University Hospital. We need to pause this story for a second though to understand how heroin, morphine, and methadone work and how they differ. Now, all of these drugs are opioid medications, which means they bind the mu opioid receptor in the body, and that's how they have their effect. But what differs between these drugs is how long they work for and how intense their effect is. Heroin and morphine work very fast, have an intense effect, but don't last very long. The result is brief pain relief, a short burst of euphoria, and then a calm sleepiness that comes after. But after this calm sleepiness is when the withdrawal kicks in. And this leads to increased pain, anxiety, and a craving for more of the drug. This is coupled with the fact that our body quickly develops a tolerance to heroin and morphine. So as a result, you need more of the drug to get the same effect as the last time you took it. This leads to increased risk of overdose, which ultimately happens because the drug decreases our body's respiratory drive, which leads to decreased oxygen levels and eventually death. 
Methadone, on the other hand, is slower and less intense. The result is no significant euphoria and very little tolerance developed by the body. It also stays in the system for a long time, which means patients don't need more than one dose per day. So if we go back to that inpatient unit at Rockefeller University Hospital, they brought in a bunch of heroin addicts and tried to find the best way to treat their addiction. The first medication they tried was morphine, but it led to this continuous cycle of giving the drug, going into withdrawal, and then the patients being concerned when they were going to get their next dose. So instead, they decided to switch to methadone. They slowly increased the dose of methadone until the patients were no longer experiencing signs of withdrawal. And from there, they then tapered the dose up until patients no longer had a craving for any of the opioids. And what they discovered was remarkable. They said, quote, the patients seemed normal. Most remarkably, their interest shifted from the usual obsessive preoccupation with timing and dose to more ordinary topics. They also discovered the concept of a narcotic blockade. In a 1964 double-blinded study they did, patients who were on methadone did not experience euphoria when given doses of heroin, morphine, or Dilaudid. And this narcotic blockade changed the way many researchers viewed addiction. Later on in 1964, they expanded the treatment. And by 1974, they had treated over 17,000 heroin addicted patients. They published the results of these 17,000 patients over 10 years in a remarkable report. The participants in the study increased their productive behavior by over 35%. Nearly all of them had criminal records prior to coming into the program. And before they started the program, they averaged 201 arrests per 100 person years. After completing the program, that number was down to 1.2 arrests per 100 person years. Also, their rate of death was essentially the same as an average person, which was compared to a three times increased risk in people that left the program. There was also a study done in Sweden that showed that heroin addicts who completed the methadone program had a 76% employment rate and were drug free. And this was compared to addicts who didn't complete the program who only had a 6% employment rate. In Sweden, they also found that there was a 79% reduction in crimes committed by these heroin addicts. But these programs didn't only just decrease crime and increase productivity, they also decreased the spread of infectious diseases, and they showed this with a study on HIV. IV drug users at that time had about a 50% chance of contracting HIV. Those who completed the methadone programs had that risk drop to 9%, and this was similar with hepatitis C. Today there are over 1,500 methadone clinics in the United States. However, there are still challenges that exist. Despite knowing how successful these treatment centers can be, only about 12% of addicts are currently enrolled at a methadone clinic. And many of these clinics are underfunded, which means that they aren't nice and they often have prohibitive hours for people. And there's also the risk for relapse, which happens to most people that stop the methadone treatment. Only about 20 to 30% of people are still abstinent from heroin after they stop methadone treatment in three years. And those who have had success getting off of methadone have said that it takes a slow taper of about one to two years. And even for the patients who are getting methadone, only 32% of them are getting a high enough dose to truly fight back the cravings. And this is mostly due to physician and patient perception and a general lack of understanding of how methadone works. Opioid addiction consumes people's lives. And this medication is not just substituting one addiction for the other. It allows people to stop craving opioids and live healthier and more productive lives. So let's get this straight. We have a medication that was invented by Nazis. It was repurposed to treat addiction. And 60 years later, we're still not using it to its full potential. What a wild world. Thanks for stopping by the channel. If you stuck around this long, please subscribe below and check out my last video. I'll see you next time.